Well, good morning. It is five o'clock a.m. here in northern Maine, and uh, going to do a study today on the sin of slothfulness. Being a sluggard, the Bible also calls it. Uh, it is a definite sin in Scripture. And uh, I've chosen this very unique location. If you can see here underneath my feet, this is an old rock wall, which we'll be talking about in the study here. We actually have a reference in, in Scripture to a rock wall. Uh, not this one, but you'll see what I'm saying in the future. But uh, the Lord has helped me to come a long way in my life. And um, I've never really been slothful in the sense of just sleeping all the time. But I've been slothful in a lot of my business and things that I've done um, and been lazy and whatnot. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we moved here to this property. Very remote property and uh, just extremely beautiful. And um, finding the benefits of getting to bed early. Uh, go to bed now 8.30 to 9 o'clock at night and get up about 4.30 or so. And uh, it's life-changing, I'll tell you what. Um, so I've had a past in going to bed very late and sleeping in late in the morning. And um, never slept till noon or anything like that. But my point is, um, the Bible says that you're to remove the beam out of your eye so that you can help your brother remove the mode out of his. And uh, I removed the, the beam out of my eye. And I'll never go back to that old way of living again. Um, let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 24. Been doing firewood for the last two days. Fell in a lot of trees. There's a whole bunch right over there behind the camera um, that I've been cutting down. Birch and maple. And uh, Proverbs chapter 24 verse 30. The Bible says, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Hmm. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and they, thy want as an armed man. Wow, a lot of things there. This rock wall that I'm standing on, or sitting on here, sitting on this big birch tree, a little bit of a stump here where they cut it off, this rock wall is basically a foundation, is what it looks like. Um, we're finding as we explore our property here that there's a lot of old ancient rock walls and I have no idea when these things were made but uh, over here to my right is a field um, this is a tree line here and in this tree line there's these old rock walls and then there's another tree line that way and there's rock walls over there but what's that tell you well whoever it was way back whenever this area was settled in the mid 1800s and whoever it was, they wanted that field over there. But there were trees there. And they had to cut those trees down. They had to clear cut that whole area. Way back in that way. And then after they clear cut it, and they got rid of the stumps, that soil had rocks in it. These rocks. Right here. And each one of these rocks was picked up by hand. And thrown onto this pile here. They didn't just throw them onto a big pile. Of, they made walls. And this is in the shape of a square. It's interesting. Very interesting. And there's a rock over there on top of this stone wall that nobody's going to be picking that thing up. Not even a couple people. <laughs> okay. It is a huge big rock wall right almost directly behind me. Um, very fascinating. Uh, there were no machines, in other words, that did this. You couldn't have piled these rocks like this with machines. Uh, and this, these walls, you can tell that they've been here for a long time. But uh, talk to an older man that was actually born and raised on this property, and he said they still farmed it, and they farmed potatoes out there in that field. And uh, their house burned down, 
and they lost a lot of things, which the house burned down sites over that way. Um, we did discover that and a lot of the ruins, a lot of the broken glass and everything, which we'll be cleaning up eventually. Um, but they moved and then this property was just sold as vacant land. And uh, the people that had this property um, literally let it go into ruin. And this was once a, an extremely beautiful property. The man told me, he said that they, people used to call it the London property because it just had these beautiful rock walls everywhere and beautiful big trees. And, and a logging company came in and just destroyed much of this property and just left so much in ruin. And uh, actually the tree I'm sitting on right now, you can see right there, that's not a chainsaw that cut that off. That's a feller buncher or other type of big machine. They just grab it and cut it off. So they just running over the rock walls and, and just did a terrible job of logging this property. No concern for the forest or the property, the beauty of the property. It's all about money. And uh, so the rock walls are now mostly covered over with little trees and, and uh, coppice growth and things like that. Um, Copus growth is a tree gets cut down and new trees sprout out of the old stump. And uh, so what do we see? The stone wall thereof was broken down. Why? Because people were too lazy to come in here and uh, build on this land and take care of this land. This beautiful property was sold and the people looked at it as money. I think the last logging here was in 2014, and that will literally be the last logging from a big commercial company. Um, there's areas of this property, too, that are just so badly rutted out from the skitters and things. It's, it's sickening to me. And uh, as long as I have this land, I'm not going to be having anybody come in here to log it. I'll do the logging myself. And um, I bought this land. Another reason I bought this land was so that uh, I don't know how long we'll be here till the catching up. Of the body of Christ who were called up to be with Jesus. But uh, I bought this land as an investment for my son. Uh, he's going to learn how to log. He's going to learn how to cut timber. He already is. And even at four years old, I'm already teaching him some things. And um, he's going to be taught to work. And he loves working. Quite a blessing. But you see, uh, most of my enemies, the atheists and things that hate this ministry, uh, religious atheists and secular atheists, uh, people that don't believe in God, uh, truly the God of the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ, those people wouldn't want a property like this. Why? Because they're slothful. They can't imagine living in a place like this with no electricity and, and uh, you know, like that. So that's why they attack me so harshly, because of this place and because of who I am. They, they hate the doctrine and they attack me as a result but let's go next to proverbs chapter 26 verse 13 through 16 the slothful man saith there is a lion in the way a lion is in the streets it's kind of interesting um the slothful man in other words is afraid to go outside because he says there's a lion out there i can't go out there's it's it's dangerous i can't go out um the other about, a, I guess, maybe a week and a half ago now, um, we were in our little area, the little shed that we cook in currently, and um, got done with eating our supper and, and uh, got up and looked out the window and just a few feet outside of the little shed there, there was a moose standing there, a big bull moose. And I knew he was a bull. He didn't have his, you know, his horns or antlers. I can never remember if moose are called, you know, if you call them antlers or horns, but deer's antlers but anyways and he's standing right behind the little shed thing there and I look down and there's the cow uh, the female moose in other words and um, it was about a week later and we were in our little sleeping cabin that we built just very small little shed again and uh, you build small see and then later on you build the actual house that's an old settling type of a thing and um so we're there in a sleeping cabin. It was a warm, warmer night. And so we had the windows open and we were, you know, doing our evening prayer. And, 
and I'm praying and I can hear this <coughs> coming through the woods, breaking some pretty big sticks. And I thought, okay, that's not a squirrel. <laughs> that's not something, I mean, that's, that's something big. It might, it might not even be a deer. It sounds pretty big. Well, same moose couple, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Moose, we call them. And they came right up to the sleeping cabin there. Well, see, I could say, well, I don't want to be out here in this property because there's moose and they can be dangerous at times and uh, mostly not, but they can get an attitude at, at times. Um, and there's bear in the area here and there's, you know, bobcats and coyotes and other things like that. I could, I probably am in danger being here. Um, you learn to live with that stuff. You learn to respect the animal and give them space. You don't go walking up on them. You learn to yell at them and things and get them to move. And, you know, and you carry uh, persuasion, we'll call it, if they get an attitude. But uh, the slothful man's not interested in that. Slothful man wants to live in the city. Not attacking you if you do. Um, <clears throat> but you ought to get out into the country sometime. Uh, just go camping or whatever else. But the slothful man wants to live in a place where everything's taken care of. And you don't have to go outside and you don't have to experience anything. Verse 14. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful man or the slothful upon his bed. <laughs> the slothful hideth, hideth his hand in his bosom. It grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. Kind of funny. It's almost like the masons with the, the hidden hand. You know, they put their hand in there. Pose like that, you know, like this. But... Uh, the sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. That's one of the most amazing things to me. Uh, I've met some real slothful people in my years of ministry. Uh, people that just, you know, grown men taking naps just throughout the day. Um, and they're not sick. I mean, I don't take a nap unless I am really, really, really sick. And then it's no longer than about maybe 30 minutes at the most. If I take a nap during the day and it goes for a couple, you know, an hour or two, um, I get really cranky and mean. I just, it, it just ruins the rest of my day. I feel like I've lost a day. And yet I've seen, you know, grown men taking naps for hours. And uh, you go and you, you know, you try to talk to them or whatever else and it's a kind of entry and then they go, uh, they could turn back over and sleep again. Kind of like a... Uh, Verse 14, as the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. Yeah, I understand about that. I've seen that. But uh, it says there, the sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Um, sluggards oftentimes are very prideful. They're very proud. Uh, I've seen that as well. They just know everything about the Bible and they, they can just issue judgments on this and judgments on that. And yet they're too lazy to do something with their life. And um, let me just say this, too. Um, I believe in the catching up of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble even gets started. Many times called the pre-trib rapture. Um, and I've proved it for years and years and years, over a hundred sermons on it. Um, it is exactly what the Bible teaches. If you don't believe it, well, you got major issues. Um, but I don't use the rapture as an excuse to not live. You know, uh, you know, I have no idea how long we have to be here yet before the Lord says, okay, come up hither. I don't know, but I'm going to live my life to the fullest down here. Um, I'm living the dream that I've always had, uh, living in the wilderness and, and things. I grew up in the woods, but I never, it wasn't, it was, you know, just about seven acres of land that I grew up on. And uh, I always dreamed of having a remote property where I would build things out of out of the trees on the property and that's the future for me and I'm, I'm excited um, I'm excited to get to know the plants on this property and, and the different types of birds and things that we have in the wildlife and the wild edibles go foraging for wild edible it's exciting um, I don't want to be a sluggard it's a it's a terrible life it's a shameful life when you're slothful Turn next to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 4 through 11. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. 
Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of, a, of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. Wow. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Um, you got to learn that, uh, yes, sleep is very important. Yes, it's part of nutritional health. You have to have proper sleep. But uh, you'll find that if you go to bed after 1030 at night, your sleep isn't going to be very good. Um, the earlier you can get to bed, the better off you're going to be. The more rested you're going to feel. You're going to hit that REM sleep, that, that really deep sleep where you wake up in the morning and you feel really rested. Um, typically, I only get about six or seven hours of sleep, and I don't need any more than that right now. There's just so much work to do. Most mornings, I'm actually in front of our wood stove in our little cabin, and, and uh, I'll get it warmed up because it still gets pretty cold here uh, in the morning, and we don't have insulation or interior paneling done yet. Do that later um, before winter sets in. But uh, I get up early. I like to get up early. Um, sleeping for more than eight hours a day is just, I don't understand. I mean, unless you have some kind of a health condition or whatever else, I don't think you should be sleeping that long. It's pretty bad. But it's interesting. It actually says, Give thy, or deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter. It's that bad. <laughs> Uh, too much sleep. If, if you sleep too much and if you're just lazy, you're slothful. You need to deliver yourself from that. It's that serious of a sin. Verse 6, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, right now... Um, you know, we were, I was doing some construction type of work and, and my son brought up the point and he said, he said, dad, he said, we need to get firewood done. <laughs> you know, it's four years old. And I said, you know what, son, you're right. I got to get this firewood done. I got to get it sawed up and split and stacked before the really warm months come of summer. Um, I think we're just about at the end of May right now. So, you know, I'm already a little bit late with getting firewood done because we only have been living here for about a month now. And, uh, you know, you have to consider that animals right now are preparing for winter. They aren't saying, hey, boy, warm day, this sure is beautiful. I mean, you know, in their own little animal way, um, I'm sure that they do enjoy what God has given them. But, you know, it, it's important for them to, to prepare for winter. You don't wait until winter to prepare. Well, Christian, we can learn from that. And we can say, you know what, I want to prepare for my house. I want to take care of my family. And, um, and it doesn't mean, you know, having your job and saving up and having some huge big retirement account or whatever else. Um, it's, there's, that, that's okay to, to save up your money and whatever else. I'm not saying you should just, you know, spend every cent that you get. But what I'm saying is, if all you ever do is work in terms of at your secular job, um, and you never take time to, to be with your family and, and, and do things to, to help you with your marriage and whatever else, and provide some things, um, you're missing the picture there. And I really believe that, that the best way to get closest to the Lord is to get out into His creation. And I'm not saying everybody else has to live, you know, off-grid in the wilderness someplace, but, uh, you know, it's good to get out in nature. It really is. Even if you live in town or even if you live in the city, I'd say, you know, do some camping. Get out and, and enjoy not the great outdoors. You know, that's a secular way of saying it. Get out and enjoy God's creation. But it takes work, doesn't it? Verse 9. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Like, just like we read earlier. Poverty is coming to this country. I'm going to tell you that right now. So the 2008 recession was bad. Um, the 2008 recession was a joke compared to what's going to be happening. And I think happening soon, very soon. Um, the American economy is about ready to collapse. Um, and it needs to collapse. That's the whole thing. I study some economics type of stuff. Um, a lot of the experts around 
the world and things around the country and, you know, college professors and whatever else. I do study secular things and they're all saying, you know, this economy is just is terrible. They're just con keeping it inflated with with debt, which leads to hyperinflation. And, and it's terrible. Um, what are you going to do if things really fall apart and you can't afford food anymore and you can't afford rent anymore and you can't afford your mortgage anymore and you can't afford a lot of things if you're a sluggard, if you're slothful? If you can't come out here and find food, what are you going to do? War comes to this country. America's in for it. I mean, America is a wicked, wicked nation. Uh, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, the Bible says. Um, America is a sinful nation. God's not going to keep blessing this country. Um, tough times are coming. I would suggest that you not be slothful when those times come. Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10, verses 26 and 27. As vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. You know what one of the biggest problems with sluggards is? Sluggards don't really fear the Lord. They don't. Um, do you realize as a Christian, you're going to have to stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ and your works are going to be tried by fire and uh, the Lord's going to look at your sluggard, sluggard ways and your slothful ways and he's going to say, hey, you really spent your time well. Boy, how many hours a day were you sleeping? Boy, that was sure smart. Um, and I'm going to kick something else, which I can, again, qualify to kick because I used to be addicted to it and that is video games. Um, one of the quickest ways to be a sluggard is to play video games. Um, instead of getting out in nature and, and actually, you know, physically interacting with God's creation, you sit in front of a television set and you play video games for hours and hours and hours. I used to do it. And I got to the point where I said, you know what, I can't move forward with my relationship with the Lord. And how can I call myself a man when I'm playing video games? And I took all my video games and I burned them. You say, what did you say? I said, I took my video games and I burned them. I didn't keep them around for times when it's, you know, rainy outside or when the lion's in the streets. You know what I mean? I burned them. I want to be a man of God. Uh, I can't be a man of God if I'm playing video games. Just as simple as that. And people say, well, uh, will video games send you to hell? That's not the question that you ask. Okay. Um, you ask, are video games, uh, am I being brought under the power? All things are lawful unto me. But, you know, are you being brought under the power of video games? Are you addicted to them? Are you playing them for hours and hours and hours? You say, well, just, you know, a little bit. A little bit turns into a lot. You start doing really good on that certain level, and, oh, I just got to beat this. I just got to get that. Oh, man, I can't believe I got to this new level here, this new part of the game. Or, wow, this is really exciting. Before you know it, five, six hours is gone. You're wasting your life. You don't fear God. I can tell you that. I can judge any one of you, and it's not hypocritical judgment because I was addicted myself. You are in sin if you're messing around with video games as a man. I, I mean, I, even as a child, we're not even going to let our son even get close to video games. Uh, the mind-rotting, you know brain-destroying times of video games that I've had in my life. And I played them ever since I was a little boy, you know, uh, going way back. We're talking 1980s. Uh, again, I can judge any one of you out there. If you're a man, grown man, and you're playing video games, you are in serious sin. I'll tell you that right now. And I get so sick and tired of loopholing Christians, and they come and they say, well, you know, is it okay if you just play? I mean, you're not going to go to hell. And I... And I Say, well, you know, you're not going to go. Oh, then Brian said you don't go to hell, so then I can play video games for hours and hours and hours and not feel any, you know, conviction of conscience about it. Sickening. Next, we're going to go to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 4. I mean, I'm sure that the people that, that uh, the men that, that made this stone wall from that field over there, carried every, every one of these stones over here by hand, I'm sure they'd be impressed with your video game prowess. <laughs> you know. 
Proverbs chapter 13, verse 4. The soul, the soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. I don't want to be a sluggard. I want to be diligent. Um, I want to be able to say that uh, my dream has always been to own wilderness land and to build things there with my hands. Um, I mean, everything that's built on this property so far, uh, my wife, my son, and myself, we built it with our own hands. Um, dry stone laid foundation on the one building and, and uh, you know, as time goes by, we'll be building with logs and whatnot and, and um, you know, uh, it's wonderful, but I can't be a sluggard. I can't be slothful. Um, right now, uh, you know, if I don't get my firewood done, um, I'm going to have a real rough time in the winter. In fact, we won't be living here in the winter. I'd have to move back to town or something like that. Um, no, not going to do that. I'm going to work hard. And when my back is aching, and, and I mean, I'm going to be 44 years old this year, and uh, and when my back is aching and my muscles are sore, you have to say, okay. Um, the flesh says, why don't you just go lay down and take a nap? And uh, But you got to fight against that. Now, I'll tell you what, living out at a place like this, too, also helps you to fight your flesh really well. You put your flesh down. Um, you don't say, hey, uh, you know, just take it easy today. Just sit around on the sofa and, you know, watch television or something like that. Oh, no, you can't do that here. Uh doesn't work. You got to work for a living here. Proverbs 19. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 15. Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you can't provide some food for yourself... Uh, through foraging, through hunting, through fishing, through gardening. What in the world are you going to do if times get rough? I mean, I heard, I heard of a story the, the one time this guy was an Alaskan hunting guide and he was telling a story about his grandpa and he said his grandfather was a, a hunter and trapper and things. And when the Great Depression happened, he just went, eh, oh well. And he went back out into the wilderness and he just lived out in the wilderness for a couple of years till the Depression was over, came back to town. <laughs> You know, and he's out there, you know, made his own clothing out of the hides of the animals that he, you know, killed and things and hunted and fished and, you know, trapped and whatever else he needed to do. He got through it, you know, and a lot of people said, oh, boy, the depression was so horrible. People were committing suicide and everything else. It wasn't horrible for all people. Uh, there were a lot of people living on farms that got by just fine. Why? Um, because you see, where's my verse at here? 19 verse 15. Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. If you're idle, playing video games, taking naps, uh, wasting your time on Facebook, uh, checking up on people and whatever else, if you're idle, uh, the time's going to come and you're not going to be able to provide food for yourself. You say, well, well brother, the, the Lord will provide. The Lord won't let us go into bad times. Uh, Christians were a lot stronger back in 1920. In the 1920s, I'll say it that way. Um, a lot more Bible believers back then. Before a lot of the new versions came out, uh, I realized that there was the American Standard Version here in America and, of course, the Revised Version in, in the UK. But uh, people were a lot stronger back then. And yet the Lord allowed them to go through the Great Depression. Hmm. You might want to get some skills there of uh, getting your own food and not being idle. Might be a good idea. Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 4. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. <laughs> Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. Um, when we first moved to the state of Maine, I was... I knew it was going to be cold and everything else, but there were a lot of times when it was it was really cold out, you know, 30 below zero and things, and and it was just nice just to sit inside our house in town and and um, 
you know, just watch YouTube videos or something like that. I, I haven't been playing video games. I gave that up shortly after getting married. My wife really helped to convict me on that whole thing, and she helped me get through it. And um, back when we were just right after we first got married, I gave up video games. Uh, so, you know, I was playing them up into my 30s. So, you know, again, that's why I'm judging you if you're out there and you're still playing them. But uh, coming here to Maine and I realized, wow, it's really cold out there. I just kind of sit around in, inside and things. And I won't go out and plow my lane until the snow's all done and whatever else. And, and uh, you know, I worked on videos and I worked on study and whatever else. I wasn't wasting my time. But uh, the last about two years, we just decided that we we're going to enjoy winter here. And we invested in some good warm clothing and uh, we had warm clothing before but you know we we invested in some good stuff and got some good snowshoes and and uh, we started snowshoeing and and just getting out in the in the woods and you can see some of my videos preaching outdoors and uh, sub-zero temperatures and and uh, we'll we'll snowshoe in 30 you know below zero now and uh, we enjoy winter and um, living here we're going to be doing a lot of work all throughout winter there isn't going to be any options there won't be any well it's it's awfully cold out there i guess i can't go and get firewood today or i can't whatever else um, where we're going to be eating and where we're going to be sleeping is separated by almost 200 yards of having to walk <laughs> and um you know that's good that's good that's what we want and uh we're fulfilling dreams that we've both had and uh you, just again i'm not saying everybody has to do this i'm not saying that we all have to be this way but but watch out for slothfulness with rough times coming brethren you cannot be slothful you have to get to a point where you say you know what i don't want to be idle i don't want to be a sluggard i don't want to be slothful and i'm just talking physical stuff right now what about the spiritual how many times have you done video games or facebook or whatever other lazy sluggish thing that you can do and you should have been reading your bible you should have been going out and distributing gospel tracts you should be talking to people about jesus christ we're going to be judged you understand your life as a christian will be judged you don't escape the judgment of god when you get saved uh, you escape the judgment of god in terms of the great white throne judgment you know you escape that and go into hell for all of eternity but you don't escape god's judgment the Lord still judges you as a Christian. And he's looking into the works that you've done after you get saved. He's going to try them by fire. How much wood, hay, and stubble are you, you know, building up when you should be going gold and silver and precious stones? Oh, there's no suffering at the judgment seat of Christ. You're a liar if you believe that. Or, you know, you've been deceived. I can say that too. Anybody teaches that there's no suffering at the judgment seat of Christ, they're lying. Uh, if any man's work shall be burned, uh, he, you know, how does it say, uh, I should turn there, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, but, you know, he shall suffer loss, the Bible talks about. You're going to realize how many times, how many hours you've wasted when you hit the judgment seat of Christ and how much more you could have done for the Lord. If we suffer down here, we shall also reign with him. How are you going to suffer when you're just taking naps all the time, when you're being slothful? A sluggard. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 13. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Yeah, that's an eventual goal of ours too as well, by the way. We like to grow our own wheat so we can grind our own flour, make our own bread. My wife already does make our own bread. We don't buy bread from the store. But uh, she does a really good job of it, whole wheat bread. Um, but we'd like to be able to have our own heirloom type of wheat uh, that we know it's not GMO or anything else. And uh, that's just not going to happen unless we work hard. Now we're going to go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 25. So, Brian, this is all Old Testament. It's all Old Testament. It was they weren't looking forward to the rapture. They you know, they were living on the earth with that's they just had to live and grow and grow old and die and whatever else, but 
we're going to be here and the Lord's going to catch us up at any moment. I hope so. But uh, the Lord's going to catch us up at any moment. Then we won't have to worry about, you know, our houses or lands or whatever else and uh, all that stuff. So I'm not going to have to work. I'm just going to give up and, and just sit here and wait until the Lord comes. Let's see what the Lord thinks about that. Pro, or, excuse me, Matthew chapter 25, verse 24 through 30. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, thou hast that is thine. And his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Slothfulness is still condemned in the New Testament. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. And by the way, if you're saying, well, that's the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, we're going to see in the Pauline epistles, it's there too. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he that shall and he shall have abundance. You know, going back to the book of Proverbs. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God doesn't think very much of you if you're slothful. And there you had these three servants, and they're each given different talents and things. And uh, God has given you talents and gifts um, according to the Holy Spirit of God. You have been given gifts, and God expects you to use them. And if you say, well, you know, I guess somewhat, you know, kind of, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I just, I'm, I'm not really feeling like uh, working for the Lord today. I just kind of want to take a nap or something or play some video games or get on Facebook and, and gossip about people and whatever else. And other kinds of laziness too, you know, sit around watching YouTube videos and things. That's another reason why I moved here because I still struggled with that. Just, you know, wasting time watching documentaries and learning and things like that. But, you know, work to do for the Lord and and uh, my studies were suffering as a result of that in terms of scripture studies and studying secular material. But I'll tell you what. You just got to get through that stuff and say, I don't want any, anything to do with that. The Lord's given me talents. The Lord's given me gifts. And I realize talent in that context is talking about a type of money and things. But, uh, you know, there's some, there's some application there for the Lord gives you gifts and you're hiding them because you're too slothful to use them. And you aren't thinking about the judgment seat of Christ. You aren't thinking about eternity, laying up treasures in heaven. You're not thinking about that. You're just thinking about your lazy life here on earth. Pretty bad. Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12. Verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Um, does that sound like slothfulness to you? A living sacrifice? Your reasonable service? Um, it's not slothfulness. Verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So a hummingbird just flew by there. Um, are you concerned with the perfect will of God in your life? Are you okay with the uh, good? Ah, good enough. That's good enough. Hmm. Good, acceptable, perfect will of God. I want the perfect will of God. I don't, I'm not going to be satisfied with just the good or the acceptable. Verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, remain humble in other words, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Be sober-minded in other words. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. And that, 
I just want to say that too. How does it make the rest of the body of Christ look when you are lazy and you become known as being slothful and a sluggard? How does it make the rest of us look? We're all connected. I had to think about that myself. How are my messages being affected by slothfulness? I think I need to get that out of my life. I mean, what kind of a testimony is it when the lost world hears a grown man talking about playing video games and bragging about playing video games? That's why I burned them. I didn't want any compromise. I wanted that perfect will of God. Verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil. You know, if you do that, abhor that which is evil, it's going to cleanse a lot of the things out of your life that you shouldn't be messing with. Facebook has all kinds of connections to the Department of Defense and all kinds of other things. It's, you know, it should be called gossip book. You know, I hear people standing around, so-and-so unfriended me on Facebook and blah, 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 blah. You know, did you see that they, oh, they posted a picture of their new wife and they shouldn't have even, you know, I, I hear the secular world and stuff talking like that. Gossip, gossip, idle talk. Video games. How many people play wicked video games? I used to. Killing and things like that, and war and whatever else. Abhor that which is evil. It'll clean up most of your life. How much evil stuff is out here in God's creation? Nothing. <laughs> Cleave to that which is good. That's why I'm here. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. How fervent are you? I was talking with a brother, a friend of the ministry, and he was talking about, you know, when he goes to his secular job, uh, working hard there. And uh, not with thy service as men pleasers, but as doing, you know, as the servants of God, doing the will of of God from the heart. Um, a Christian man should be known as a hard worker. Uh, people at your place of employment should understand that you're a Christian by how hard you work. Something to think about. It's part of your testimony. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. We'll end it here. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, New Testament commandment for a Christian, that if any would not work, he's a sluggard. There's a line in the streets. It's too cold. I can't plow. I can't go out and gather. I can't this. I can't that. I have to take a nap. If any would not work, neither should he eat. Paul would rather see somebody that's a Christian, a Christian, mind you, you know, if any, talking about the body of Christ there, if you see somebody who's a sluggard, somebody that's slothful, don't help them. Don't give them money. Just as simple as that. You say, well, but they barely have any money. They can't even buy food. Okay. They shouldn't eat. That's how serious a sin slothfulness is. God would rather see you die of hunger, of starvation, than let you fall in, into the trap of slothfulness. Verse 11, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Yeah. Um, I do this ministry, and I've done this ministry now for a while. 
Uh, but this isn't what I'm planning to do for the rest of my life in terms of YouTube and, and just putting out free videos and things like that. Um, there's a lot of plans that I have for the future. And uh, part of that is doing my own, you know, bringing out videos offline and, and maybe writing books eventually and things like that. And um, I do, I've always had other ways of income, other secondary types of income. I mean, I, I've made the sacrifices over the years to, to bring out videos. I used to do DVDs early on. And um, I've just decided, you know, I can affect more change, do more work for the Lord by putting out my material for free on YouTube. Use YouTube as a platform. Um, but there's people, liars, and they'll come out and they'll say, Denlinger's all about money. Um, there's better ways to make a living than this. Just putting out videos for free on YouTube, believe you me. Um, and if I was all about money, why haven't I ever monetized my channel? I've never monetized even one video. YouTube occasionally will take a, I have a video with a music soundtrack in it, and they'll, they'll monetize it because of the music soundtrack, and I fight it, and I say I have the copyright for that music, and I've fought that thing for years. But uh, if I'm all about money, um, then I act in kind of some strange ways. People that are all about money don't move out in the middle of nowhere where life is hard and uh, where you're waking up every day with sore muscles and sore back and everything else. People that are all about money live in the city. Verse 13, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man. And have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Um, I've been guilty of not doing that. I've known of brethren that, uh, that are slothful, that are sluggards. And I haven't noted them. And I'm going to be in the future. Why? Uh, the Bible says that he may be ashamed. Notice it does not say that she may be ashamed. I'm not saying women have a right to be sluggards or slothful. But the women are supposed to be keepers at home. And not working outside the home. But when you get a guy that's uh, not providing for his own, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That's pretty serious. Um, it's very serious. Uh, and in the future, when I find out, you know, uh, about a man that calls himself a Christian and he's not providing for his own and he's not working and, and he's being slothful and a sluggard, I'm going to have to do some things to make him ashamed. So, more on that later. Verse 15. Yet, count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. You know, I've had different brethren over the years, and they've admonished me in different ways and, and encouraged me to move in certain directions. And uh, that's why I'm here today. Um, and I've even had, you know, lost people encourage me to live this off-grid life and uh, to work hard. Um, and I'm thankful for that. And uh, if I attack you for being a slothful, sluggard type of a person, uh, you need to take that as a challenge. Not as, I'm your enemy now, but as a challenge. The Bible said earlier there that, you're to deliver yourself as a roe from the hand of the hunter. Uh, when a deer knows it's going to be shot at, you know, uh, it's, it's incredible to me. I've seen, you know, I used to go hunting myself, but I've seen, you know, deer hunting videos and things, and you'll see the deer, and they're walking around through the woods, and they're constantly looking around. They'll take a few steps, and they stop, and they look around, they listen, you see their ears moving. And all of a sudden, some hunter up in a tree stand that they don't see him, and he goes to draw his bow, and he just makes the slightest little noise, to, you know, hits a branch with his arm or something, you know, and the deer just, and they just run as, as fast as they can. They don't say, oh, I think that there's probably a hunter nearby. Uh, I think I'm just going to lay down and take a nap. Are you kidding me? They run with all of their might as fast as they can to get away from that hunter. Um, brethren, that's what we need to be like when it comes to slothfulness as Christians. We need to say, i got to deliver myself from this. I don't want to fall into the trap of slothfulness. I don't want to get into a point where I'm bringing shame to the body of Christ, where I'm bringing shame to my Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross. He redeemed me. 
He paid for my sins. What am I going to do with my life now? There better be, better be some changes. There needs to be some changes. Uh, don't be a sluggard. Okay? So that's my challenge for you this morning. 50 minutes of preaching. Now 10 till 6. Uh, we got a big day ahead of us. More firewood to do, of course. And uh, tell you what, I'll just come over here. Ah, man, that stump was not the most comfortable thing to sit on. I have to wear a pretty heavy flannel here. Let me just do this. I'll show you here some of the firewood cutting. You can see a lot of the logs are down and going over this way. Normally when you're logging, you, you uh, would pick a, a certain lay for the trees. You'd say, I'm going to fell them all out this way or whatever else. But because of this nice stand of, of uh, balsam fir trees here, I didn't want to mangle them up. So I have them felled in different directions and things. And uh, a lot of work. It's enjoyable. And I pray that this message has been a, a great challenge to you to, you know, maybe some of you would want to live live off grid and, and move out into the country and be around God's creation. Um, there's nothing like it. You feel such a closeness to the Lord and out here and without all, all the distractions of the city or town life. Um, it's wonderful. I highly recommend it. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for, your, for watching.